Well, hello again. This is Dave Burkus, and this is the Burkus Report, where I tell stories about exits for companies that are able to sell well, startups for companies that are just beginning in business, and great business practices in between. But more importantly, I tell stories about entrepreneurs like you, and those entrepreneurs that have done well or done poorly. But all of them have stories to tell, and most of them have great lessons we can learn. Today, we're going to talk about exits. We're going to talk about preparing for the valuation of your company and finding a way to exit your company. So number one, the Burkus method, which is a way of valuing your company and finding out whether or not your company is worth the kind of money that you think it is. There are many ways to value a company, and they really involve finding out whether or not the company is in revenue, whether or not the company has intellectual property, and much more. But what I've found is there are five basic things that you can use to value your company, even if there is no revenue, even if you're pre-revenue. And I'd like to talk about those for a few seconds. First of all, the valuation depends upon you, the idea, the team, whether or not you have an idea which the buyer is willing to pay money for. And so what I've done is divide the items that I'm about to talk about into five various classes. And the first one, the value of the idea, your company, the team, is worth up to about $500,000. If it's a great idea and one that makes the buyer excited, that is a $500,000 idea. And the second one would be whether or not the team itself is able to carry this company through to, in this case, the execution of the uh, agreement to sell, or if it's a brand new sale, the execution of earning money for the company. And if the team itself, without having to replace people, without having to add people, can do just that, that's worth another $500,000 and gives me a chance to see the value of the company increasing based upon that alone. Have you produced the product itself? If it's a young company, have you produced a prototype? Have you done something that gives us the opportunity to know that there's value out there? And if so, there yet is another up to $500,000 worth of valuation. Do you have strategic relationships that would give you the opportunity to use other people's relationships to get things done. And if so, there's another valuation of up to 500000 And finally, if you're in sales and the product has rolled out, is the public accepting it? Because what you've done by doing that is to reduce financial risk and reduce market risk, and that's up to another 500000 So for very small businesses, the value can be almost nothing, up to about $2.5 million. Beyond that, then we use other financial methods of determining. So test yourself for those five things. Have you found your company in a sweet spot in any of those areas? Do you have a value that you think you can begin to zero in on that a buyer might look for? It's just a beginning, a way of finding out whether or not your business is as valuable as you think it is. Next, let's talk for a few seconds about a way in which you can find the buyer. You know, there are business brokers for small businesses, and there are business dealers who have licenses for very much larger deals, but there is a way of your doing it yourself. And there's an exercise which I have some of my companies perform that you might be interested in, and that exercise is to list 10 companies that could be your business buyers. So if you make a spreadsheet, if you make a list on a piece of paper, think of four columns and up to 10 rows. And each column would have value. The first would be the name of one of those companies, up to 10, that could buy your company. And the second would be what it is that they would want if they had perfect knowledge of what your company did. We'll call that your core competency. And the third is what you or your company would want from that buyer. And you think about that for a second. It's not the money and the purchase. Of course, that's part of the deal. It is what you would want from that buyer if your company could succeed more as a part of that buyer's enterprise. And fourth, finally, what's the likelihood of this happening? Zero means it isn't, 10 means it will, and somewhere in between. If you go back to column number two, what you're going to find is that more than 40% of the companies, as you try and get inside their heads, will want the same thing from you as each of the others. The thing that's important about that is, many times I've discovered that is not what you think is the most important thing your company produces. It may turn out to be your intellectual property where you think it's the product. It may turn out to be you and the people where you think it's the product. It's a great exercise. It's one you should all perform and it's one that makes a lot of sense to do. So finally, let's talk just about the kind of business buyers there are. There are three kinds of business buyers. The first is the financial buyer that 
runs the numbers and decides how much your business is worth based upon how much that business will generate over time. That isn't your best buyer because that's not the one where the most money will come. The second is the strategic buyer, the one who can integrate your business with his or her business and make the two worth more than each alone. That is worth a premium and therefore it is worth extra money. The third is the one that I found is the one you go for and rarely find and that is the buyer who is emotional. And I had that happen with a business that I sold once and the emotional buyer found and I found that there was something that I didn't know about when I made the sale but found out afterwards and it taught me a lot. What I found was the emotional buyer was about to have the first announcement ever of a reduction of revenue. It was a public company and our company had enough revenue to cover that reduction as well as help move that company from a hardware based company into a software based company. And in the end they paid much more than they would have ordinarily to close that deal before the end of the quarter and to be able to announce both things. They were now in the software business and their revenues were up. You just never know. How about that president or CEO that sees you winning business from that company and gets angrier and more unhappy every time one of those sales is lost? That becomes not a strategic but an emotional buyer. If you can find an emotional buyer after doing your list of 10 and if you have a valuation that looks like it's something reasonable and you can begin to build upon that, you have a winner. Today we talked about exits. This is Dave Burkus from Burkonomics and the Burkus Report. I'm Kevin McDonald. You're watching I Am Business, and we're here in the middle of the desert just outside of the Calico Ghost Town. It's dirty, it's fun, it's badass, and with me today is Jeff Cranny, the CEO of Lockstraps. Now, believe it or not, I actually have lock straps on my truck. Only got them yesterday, and I'm super excited about them. So, Jeff, why don't you tell me what lock straps are all about? Sure. Uh, well, thanks for having me out here. We had a beautiful day out here. Great time riding. It's just, it's just great out here. Yeah. Uh, but you know, you come out here, and you come out here for a good time, and you go riding or whatever, and you come back to your truck, and you find something missing. And I'll tell you what, that just ruins your whole vacation. So. Uh, you know, there's a lot of times on the way here you might have to stop for gas or, you know, stop and get some food. And the whole time you're in the restaurant, you just keep looking at your truck. And it takes the peace of mind away. And uh, so what we did is we uh, just came up with a locking tie-down strap. I figured you got to tie your stuff down, so why not have it locked as well? So I have a brand new trailer, and on that trailer are two propane tanks. And rather than sit here and concern myself with whether or not they're going to get stolen when I take off to do whatever I'm going to do in the desert, they're now strapped down using lock straps, which is really cool. The timing was perfect. Just bought the trailer a week ago. So must be serendipity, right? <laughs> perfect serendipity. timing, yeah. So would you be willing to give us a, a little demo of how they work? Absolutely, of course. All right, I'll tell you what. In just a minute, we'll be right back, and we're going to take a look at how lock straps work. <laughs> locks are about honest people and those that are quick that's right yeah and what tools you have you know how what tools do you have and how much time do you got yeah so so this is like rolling up the window on your truck um, there's no way for the end here to slide through because of the galvanized steel rivet so there's no way that they can get it through there uh -huh. um, I actually had a client I, I learned a lot from my clients by the way because a lot of my clients like to play it's just like we do and uh, he asked me if we could make this piece lock so there was no way to loosen it uh -huh. and I told him well you know I've got a lot of money in the tooling in this but uh, you know what, give me a few weeks, let me see if I can figure out a way to lock this. Well, he sent me a picture of his rhino with his ice chest locked down in the back of his truck where he took it and he tied it behind the clasp and then put the, the uh, end inside oh, here. So he kept the distance, the length. Of the That's road. right, and that way there was no way to, to loosen it. Yeah, so. So to understand, he actually, uh, we tried this earlier before I got mine for my truck, and he actually showed me with the bolt cutters. You cut through this and it just mashes, it doesn't actually cut. So nobody in a hurry, even if they bring a set of bolt cutters, is going to get away with their equipment when you're using lock straps. But I, bought, I got a pair right here, let's try it. Right, I want you to see it. I want you to grab them, I'll hold on to this. Yeah, and here. Let me, show. Let, me, uh, let me show you this stuff. Well, first of all, they call these uh, the key to everything. <laughs> it'll break a window, it'll, uh, it'll break a lock. There's a lot of things that these break. It's called bolt cutters and uh, it's a very popular tool. 
But uh, at, just for fun, um, I brought with me a cable because this is what a lot of us have used before. And I'm not here to put this product down. It's a great product. But at the end of the day, um, go ahead and just hold that like that. All you got to do is put this around here like this and just snip it and it's done. Butter. Yeah. And so, you know, that's kind of scary. All you got to do is jump out of their truck and do that. So um, with the strap, I'm just going to grab one out of the bag here so we don't have to break a brand new one. Okay. So if you could just hold that there. Okay. And here's the bolt cutters and I'm going to come up to the strap with my bolt cutters and let's try the other side flip, <laughs> yeah, it around. flip it around as you can see it's gonna it's gonna take a lot of work for them to get that I'm out of breath now <laughs> so uh yeah you know it just makes life a lot easier um one of the other unique things about it is um a lot of the tie down straps are built just like this. Uh, probably 90% of the straps on the market have a hook just like that. Mm -hmm. And these hooks come undone. Yeah. And uh, I've actually yeah. experienced that myself. Yeah, yeah. You see ladders on the side of the freeway, you see wheelbarrows, all kinds of stuff. And it's because these hooks have come undone. That's one of the things that's nice about the lock straps as well is that because it's a full loop, you don't have to worry about them popping off. So, uh, you know, that's a nice feature. So, for those times when you're in the desert and you want to take a ride and walk away, drive away from your equipment, Lock straps is what it looks like to me. Thank you so much for coming all the way out here. We really appreciate it. We got the rolling green one over here today. And uh, yeah. thanks for taking the time to talk. So I really appreciate your sharing. Yeah, thanks for having me out. Right. It's been a great time. Thank you so much. All right. All right. I'm Kevin McDonald. You've been watching Ion Business outside of the Calico Ghost Town. This is Jeff Cranny with Lock Straps. Thank you so much for watching. Welcome to Ion Business Innovation, where we look at innovative companies, innovative products, and the innovative people that run those companies and make those products. Tonight, we are very privileged to have with us Mary Beth Grant Butler and Richard Butler. Welcome to the show, folks. Thank you. Lovely to be here. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about your background. You have kind of an unusual combination of skills, uh, the two of you. So tell us how you got started here. Okay, so I'm a physical therapist, a licensed physical therapist, and in addition to that, I have a PhD in movement sciences. So okay. what I do is look at movement and analyze movement, and my goal is to improve how we provide physical therapy, and pr particularly I specialize in pediatrics. Okay, now Richard, you have a slightly different background, right? Yes, I'm a clinical psychologist. I've worked in both rehabilitation and various other places in clinical psychology, and I wanted to get more involved in research and so I started taking classes in the computational sciences program at Chapman. And then as part of that, I started doing, working on computers mm -hmm. and writing code to automate her research. Okay. And so that's how we got started in this. Now, ultimately, who will benefit from your device and your service? Well, we're hoping quite a few people. So um, as early as my specialty area is preterm infants, Okay. Um, so born really before they're supposed to be here. Okay. So All we right. want to start with that population All and right. then expand it to um, adults, um, okay. maybe with a sports injury, okay. and continue on in the lifespan all the okay. way to people uh, in their later years um, who who maybe have an issue that that they want to get better at their movement. Okay, sounds good. Movement. Now, how will this particular invention uh, process uh, change the the game? So when we're looking at somebody with research um, at their movement, we use very expensive pieces of equipment. As a matter of fact, those pieces of equipment were really developed for animation. Um, and so we may use something like this, um, okay. and we'll put these markers on somebody, and the markers can get big, and we'll have many, many markers all over the body. Okay. And we use these very expensive pieces of equipment, and we look precisely at how they're moving, and we look at very high speed. So we're looking at maybe 200 times a second okay. how they're changing, and right. they're moving, and they're doing something functional, like walking. Um, our system is going to change that, because in this system, using our device and the software that we're developing, you don't have to put any markers on somebody. Okay. And okay. they can walk right into your um, frame and you can see what they're doing. And it's maybe not cycling quite as quickly as we would for research, but okay. certainly quick enough for a physical therapist to figure out exactly what you're doing um, and how that movement's changing. So our device would be able okay. to not only look at the minute, that how you're moving or the second, within a second, how you're moving, but we want to look at how what we're doing changes 
your learning and over time. Ah, okay, okay. Now, what, what our viewers probably can't see is we actually have a live model who's, um, who's being recorded by your device and without any markers. Right. Okay. So absolutely no markers, and we can see how they're moving. Um, and when we're looking at this as PTs, the output from here is going to slow it down and show us exactly how that movement is changing. Um, and so our output is really important to inform physical therapists. And that's the other great thing about our devices. It is actually targeted to help people who are clinicians working with people okay. um, and how they're changing versus a researcher who has maybe okay. a different goal in mind. The other lovely thing about our device is it's going to be really affordable. Okay. We want All multiple right. pieces of okay. this equipment in every clinic and every hospital and, mm -hmm. um, and so that they're available to people to really actually okay. use. Okay. So yeah. we're just using common gaming equipment. Okay. And then using that with our software and our movement analysis, giving the physical therapist an output that's useful for them. Plus, we can have joint angles and their motion recorded in real time okay. while a person's doing a functional activity, not just measuring a person when they're standing still. Now, if I have some kind of an injury, um, how would I participate in this and how would I actually um, benefit from this? So one thing that we're going to be looking at is maybe how you start out moving. Okay. And then we're going, we want to, with this system as well, build up a huge stockpile of how somebody would normally do that function. Okay. okay. And so we're going to compare what normal would look like with what you're doing. Okay. And then okay. I can change something about the way you're moving. So maybe okay. have you focus on something different. And then in real time figure out, are you actually getting closer to what I would normally expect in somebody, or okay. typically expect, or am I moving away from that? Okay. So this really is targeting what you're doing right now and bringing you back towards a function that will be okay. pain-free okay. or appropriate. Okay, sounds good. And it can give us live feedback to both the therapist and the client. Okay. So the client can actually see what they're trying to do and see themselves in a stick figure or another kind of avatar we could put on there. So it's like biofeedback but for physical movements. Exactly. Okay, gotcha. Now, uh, what stage is this business in? How would you describe that? So we're at the point of we can, we've developed the software enough that we're, um, we can see the person. We've got um, some we're, mathematical equations written for actually getting some of the output we want. Um, and at this point, we're, we're well, what finalizing. We're, yeah, and we're, we're collecting some research, okay, okay. comparing our output data on this device with the output data on the more expensive machines, making sure that what we're getting is precise enough okay. to put out there. So we're kind of doing that background research. Now, as I understand it, you're also part of a special program at Chapman University. Can you tell us about that? We are. So um, we are part of an e-village program okay. um, that helps entrepreneurs like us um, move along. We get some great coaching along the yeah, way. And in addition to that, um, we've started a program for faculty at okay. Chapman University, um, and it's called eLeave. And okay. faculty are given the opportunity to apply okay. and then take a semester and really push their product forward and, and make it go forward. So right now, we're at the beginning of an eLeave. I'm taking an eLeave okay. from, my, from my job at the university to push this project forward so that we can you know, help clinical as okay. well as research. Now, let me ask you one last question here. Um, there's a lot of viewers out there that are not this far along with their research or building their business. Uh, what advice do you have for young entrepreneurs out there based upon your own experience? We come from a background of clinicians, and we don't have the business experience. So connecting with mentors who have business experience who can guide you along the way has been really helpful for us. And building your team. Building your team is really important. Okay. Make sure that you have combined or pulled together people who can work well together and who bring, each of them bring a special um, sort of knowledge or special skill to the table. Sounds good. Now, if people want more information on what you're doing research-wise or business-wise, how would they get in touch with you? Um, well, we set up an email for our company. It's PIM, that's what we're calling our, um, our company, Precision in Motion. Okay, Precision in Motion. Dot Butler, B E U T T L E R, at gmail.com. Okay, great. Well, look, I really want to thank you folks. Uh, it sounds like very impressive research. It has a great uh, potential for people out there, again, from kids to seniors to 
people uh, who had injuries. I mean, it's very impressive. I uh, really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you, for Thank you having folks. Us. Thank, Thank you for having us. Yep. Thank you. You've been watching Eye on Business Innovation. Hi, my name is Sven Johnston. I work for a local company here called GigaSavvy. We're an ad agency um, focused on the online industry. And tonight I would like to give you some insights into kind of the changes and involvement of social media. So as most people think of social media, they think of Facebook, Twitter, but in reality social media has been around for much longer than that. Talking about bulletin boards, forums, so it's going back like, you know, 10, 20 years easily since the early ages of computer. But for most people, you know, social is Facebook, Twitter, and the newer things out there. So I'd say kind of like around 08 or 09 when those things kind of came into light, people really got aware of it. Um, at the beginning, there wasn't a lot of noise in social. So if you would do a really good job, you could really kind of make an impact. A lot has changed over time. And I see some of the challenges that people think. One, they think it's free. And it is technically free, but it's just a very time-intensive process. So it's labor-intensive, which means you have to kind of budget for that. The other thing that has changed a lot as well is that, as I said, in the past, you kind of could organically kind of grow your community and really kind of get out there. Nowadays, you kind of have to think about that you also have to have some ad budget to add on top of that because a lot of the platforms like Facebook, for your content to actually be visible, you kind of have to put some money to it to basically have either like a sponsored post or basically give it more attention. Um, the key thing in social in general is community building. Um, a lot of people get obsessed about the numbers, you know, how many likes you have or fans, what it used to be. Um, the key thing is that you build a community that really is, you know, a true promoter of your product, that really love what you do, um, that share the content because they want to share it. Um, that then combined with um, some ad budget and some creative you know, design assets, you can really build a huge community that can support you long term. Um, people always ask, you know, do it in-house or use an agency. Ultimately, we always tell our clients that ultimately long term, you want to do it in-house and maybe have an agency that supports you. But sometimes that's not possible, so you can start with an agency to basically build you the team kind of run it and then slowly transfer it over and then use the agency, you know, as a consultant that kind of give you insight and trends. Because one thing that I feel, especially in the online marketing space, yes, you can have an else team, but it's never going to be as good um, just with the trends changing so fast. I mean, I always say, like, you know, things evolve every 9 to 12 months. So definitely have an outside resource to help you in that. Um, but... You know, be out there, have some fun, find the story that your company um, is proud of and, you know, that people want to share. Because the core thing about social is, you know, why should people care? So you have to have a story that basically people want to be involved in and get passionate about. Hey, my name is Ash Kumra. I'm the chairman of Tech Coast Venture Network, commonly known as TCVN. We're a nonprofit that helps the entrepreneurial ecosystem grow in the Southern California area. TCVN has been around for almost 30 years now and one of the things that we do really well at is empowering entrepreneurs. We do events, we provide access to mentorship and we provide resources such as contacts to capital, guidance on your business development and all these things that can really help the entrepreneur kind of journey grow. And I'm really proud of the impact that we've made in the Orange County landscape for quite some time now. Um, we do more monthly events than any other organization. And what's beautiful about our organization is that we're a nonprofit. So our bragging right isn't about how much money we make, it's about how many entrepreneurs do we touch and affect. It's a great metric and it allows us as a board, which are all volunteers that just want to pay it forward, to really just focus on how can we help entrepreneurs. And that also allows every dollar that comes into our group, through sponsors, through tickets, through things like that, to just continue to do more events. Most notably, uh, we do this annual pitch contest called Survivor. Uh, the last two survivors, we actually gave out a $25,000 cash prize for the best investment opportunity. And it's an adventure because the last survivor, we had over 125 companies participate. It started off with the best 30 second pitches, then went down to the top 10, then it went down to the top three. It was an adventure. Um, the, the other thing that's really great about our group is that we've now touched into two other areas. One is the high school mentorship. We've actually successfully helped various high school entrepreneurs 
realize their dream opportunity. And we're actually helping them with resources, guidance, and things like that. And because of our success in Orange County, we're now in LA and we've had a couple events there. So we're now trying to become a leading entrepreneur nonprofit to grow the Southern California ecosystem. Thank you.